Well, guys, I want to talk to you for a little bit about what I think to be the most important thing in the entire world. <laughs> it flows into how we treat our friends. It flows into how we treat ourselves. It flows into how we preach, how we evangelize. It, it, it flows into how we pray. It flows into how we worship. I want to talk to you about the beauty of the king and how we see him affects everything. I remember Art Katz once said, is not the root of all of our ills, the failure to radically apprehend God as he is? Is not the root of all of our ills, the failure to radically apprehend God as he is? So I want to talk to you about the beauty of the king because in seeing the beauty of the king, everything changes, everything switches. The heart is seized. And as St. Augustine said, you have stolen my heart and ran away to heaven with it. <laughs> That's what begins to happen as we see the beauty of Jesus and how wonderful he is. And the text that I'm going to use for this, uh, this time, and I encourage you to, to take some notes or, and follow along if you, if you can. Uh, this is an amazing portion of scripture. <laughs> Literally, it's hard to find anything that is as unveiling of the irresistible beauty of Jesus as this section. It's in Song of Solomon chapter five. We see the bride and the bridegroom are throughout this entire book. And at this moment in time, the bride is asked about the one that she loves. Yeah, I know the, those of you that are watching, you love him. And she's asked about the one that she loves. And her description of him is going to light on the inside of you fresh attraction to Jesus. You're going to feel, even as we talk about these things, how beautiful he is. You're going to feel a fresh burning of the flame of love in your heart because he is altogether lovely. Is, is there not a charm in his every feature? There absolutely is. And even in the crackle of the flame, the martyrs sung of his infinite charms. He is altogether lovely and he will never be anything otherwise than all fair. So in chapter five, verse nine, the question is asked, what kind of beloved is your beloved? Modern day would probably be like, so this guy you're interested in, what's so special about him? Why you like this guy, you know? And she goes like this, check this out. <laughs> this is crazy. This is why she loves him. My beloved is dazzling. This word for dazzling has to do with brightness extreme. So much so that you are, uh, your consciousness of your surroundings is temporarily suspended. <laughs> he dazes you. She says, why? They say, why do you love him? She says, he is brightness extreme. He is pure light. He is magnificent glory. The Bible says that God lives in light unapproachable. So this is indicative of the fact that Jesus is the almighty God, the blinding one. Even as Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of, Tra of Transfiguration, uh, it says that his his clothes became white like lightning, literally resplendent with glory. We see that when John sees Jesus in Revelation in his glorified God-man state, he's so bright and he's so shining that Paul, uh, sorry, John falls face down on the ground because of the splendor and majesty of Jesus. She says, why do I love him? Look at him. He's God almighty. But look at what she does next. This is crazy. It's such a drastic change from the brightness extreme down to he's dazzling and ruddy. The definition of this word ruddy is the color of red, the color of red. Now we know that blood is red. <laughs> and so we see she swoops down out of the heights of glory down into human blood. Why do I love him? Because he's not only the glorious God, but he's also the one who bleeds and bled for me. The scripture says, 
and revelation that the lamb was seen and he had seven horns and seven eyes. And he was as though a lamb that was slain or a lamb slain. In other words, Jesus manifests himself in the book of Revelation, still bleeding. He still bleeds for you in the sense of his blood still is active and still works. It never wears thin. Why do I love him? He's brightness extreme. He's a bleeding dream. That's why I love him. He is beautiful in splendor and beautiful in lowliness. There's not one that's higher or brighter than him. And none has went as low as the blood of death, his love blood. <laughs> oh my goodness. He has love blood for you. You, you know, I would just want to ask you, maybe there's something that you're interested in right now uh, that's, that takes your interest more than Jesus. I want to ask you, did that thing bleed for you? It didn't, you know, it didn't. You Maybe there's a guy that has more of your attention or a girl that has more of your attention than Jesus right now. I want to ask you, did they bleed for you? They did not bleed for you. <laughs> and, that, and not only that, are they shining with splendor from the heavens? No, there is nothing comparable to this beauty of the God man who shines with resplendent glory and gives his blood for you. Tommy Tenney once said, he's been ripping veils and dripping blood for 2000 years just to get to you. Why do I love him? Look at these things. He's dazzling. And he's ruddy. Look at what she says next. And he is, my beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. Uh, the King James Version actually says the chiefest among 10,000. Know, Charles Spurgeon once wrote about this verse. And he said, there is no such word as chiefest. Then he says, but such is the weight of of Christ's perfections. He breaks down vocabulary and causes men to make up words they've never known to articulate something they've never seen. <laughs> Why do I love him? There's nothing like him. He's the chiefest among 10,000. Somebody would say, some smart guy would turn and say, 10,000 what? Well, 10,000 whatever you want. 10,000 shepherds pale in comparison to the good shepherd. 10,000 angels, they literally bow down before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 10,000 warriors drop their swords before the captain of the host of the Lord. The 10,000 lovers could never woo your heart like him who is shining with glory and bleeding with blood. There's nothing like him. He is tremendous in every facet. He is the chiefest among 10,000. He is literally outstanding among all the rest. The word here that's used for outstanding actually has to do with a flagpole raised up above other things to get attention. He is he's so high and glorious that he's lifted up above all other things. He stands out. He's outstanding. Everything is here. He is above all of them. Even as Paul the Apostle writes in Colossians, he is the uh, firstborn of all creation. In other words, the one who created everything has entered into the things he created. And by virtue of the fact that he created the things that he entered into, he is triumphant or preeminent above or in the midst of all things created as the one who created them and subjecting himself to being part of his own creation. <laughs> he is just transcendent among all others. There isn't anyone that stands next to him. You know, the wonderful song, you have no rival, you have no equal, you know, or the other one, there's none beside you. There's none, be not even one close to you. Uh, the scripture says that he's far above all who surround him. Though there are tremendous angels and there's a numberless multitude that surround his throne worshiping day and night, none of them come close to him. Charles Spurgeon once said, he said, there isn't one item on the earth that excels the smallest item in heaven. And there isn't one item in heaven that excels the smallest measure of Jesus. In other words, Jesus has set his glory manifests his glory even greater than the heavens. He is the beloved of heaven, the worshiped of heaven, and the worship of the earth. The angels love him because none have went higher. We love him because none 
has went lower than him. He is brightness extreme, a bleeding dream, the outstanding among 10,000. Now, it gets a little crazy here. Check this out. I hope you're liking this because I really love this. I love looking at the son of man. It, it makes my life make sense to the angels who behold his face. Nothing else makes sense than to give all my attention and my heart affection to this man, Christ Jesus, who loved me while I was still a sinner, before I cared about him, before I gave two cents about God, before I even thought about any gospel truths, he loved me so much that he gave himself for me. And I say the same for every one of, of you guys. And even as you preach the gospel to people, the love of God rests upon all humanity because it's not dependent upon how good they are or how, how bad they've been. None of these things matter. He died while we were still sinners. In other words, the demonstration of his love was already maxed out. He can't show his love any more than he already has by dying and suffocating and bleeding on a tree where every drop of blood drips from the tree and creates a symphony for our souls. There isn't a greater demonstration of love, and he did it before we even loved him. So this love is maxed out. It's hard to comprehend, but we are the proclaimers, those who come forth from the king's chamber to enter out into the world to tell men of this indescribable love of God that while we were yet sinners, Christ has died for us. Therefore, repent and be saved. Praise God. So the next thing it says here, it says, she's describing him. Why do you love him? Why do I love him? His head is like gold, pure gold. Now, I want to, call your attention to why she says gold. In the Old Testament, as you've read through the tabernacle and the, the most holy place, you see that it was a command by God to overlay everything in the most holy place where his presence dwelled, where the glory was with gold. So gold represents the glory of God. Why do I love him? Because his head is gold pure gold, the best of the best, the glory of all glories. This is who he is. This is the crown upon him. This is his actual person. He is the glory of God, even as the scripture says in Colossians, that he is the image of the invisible God. Or in Hebrews chapter one, he is the radiance of the divine. He is the glory of God. Even as John says that the glory of God tabernacle literally walked in our midst. We saw his glory, John says. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only son of God. So my beloved is dazzling, ruddy, outstanding among 10,000, and he is the glory of God. He is the holy place walking around. You, you recognize reading through Exodus, how incredible the holy place was. Holy place was. I mean, uh, children and, and, and men uh, of all ages, they were informed of the wonderful holy place, the tabernacle of God, where the cloud of glory came up from and the pillar of fire came down to. It was the phenomenon of the entire age. God Almighty in that tent, so much so they wouldn't even want to speak with him because of how glorious he was. He shakes the mountain with his glory. And so we see that Jesus Christ, the beloved, your bridegroom, the one who wants to marry you, the one who desires your love and your affection, the one who has given all his love and his affection over, over to you in order to win you, to draw you through his love. Even as it says, if I be lifted up, indicating what kind of death he would die, being hung on a tree, literally suffocating and bleeding to death, that lifting up, he says, I will draw all men to me. It's the cross of Christ and that demonstration of love that draws all men to himself. And so we see here, this wonderful, glorious Christ is the glory of God, the manifest tabernacle of God. Why do I love him? He is the most holy place. Next thing it says here, his locks and are, are like clusters of dates. I want to stop you right there because this is very significant. She does this again, where she talks about the heights and then goes down into the depths to make sure that you realize Jesus is not just beautiful in the heavens. He's beautiful on the earth. He's the most beautiful in the earth and he's the most beautiful 
in the heavens. Just as she said, he's brightness extreme up here. And then he's also bleeding for me down here. But it says that his, his, his head is gold. That's the glory that's up here. And then his locks are as a cluster of dates. A cluster of dates is a, a living organism in this world, part of the natural system of existence that is dependent upon the principle of life. And she's saying that he is the glory of God and yet subjected himself to the natural order, the natural order of this world. He entered into the natural order, a cluster of dates, a something dependent upon the principle of life that grows in this world. Jesus grew in grace and truth. His body grew because he subjected himself to the to the incredible system of existence that we know were the restrictions and frailties of a human body he came into it now it says this next and not only is his his locks like a cluster of dates but black as a raven if you look at leviticus chapter 13 you see that when a disease a certain kind of disease spread amongst the children of israel that their head and the skin on their head became black with infection Check this out. That represents disease. And she's saying, why do I love him? Not only because he's the glory of God and not only because he subjected himself to this existence, but he also took my disease, my disease upon him. He has taken sin upon himself, as well as the phrase raven or the word raven. We know ravens to be a a, a a dirty bird, according to the scriptures, contrasted with a dove. So Jesus has taken on all of the shame, all of the disease, all of the darkness, all of the weight of sin while entering into this system of existence as the glory of God. So we say, why do we love him? Or they say, why do you love him? She begins to preach the gospel to them. He is God Almighty, the glorious King who came down to save me in this world, became a man and took sin upon himself. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Praise God. The next thing it says here is his eyes are like doves. This is beautiful because as you've read through the gospels, you saw in John that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus as a dove. So this is indicative of or indicating the Holy Spirit. His eyes are like doves. The, the activity of the Spirit is inside the eyes of Jesus. People are like, why don't I have the activity of the Spirit in my life? Well, it's found looking at the Lord. You can't look for manifestations and expect them. Look at Jesus and he will cause them. They're a signs and wonders follow those that adhere to the person of Jesus Christ. That's the looking at the Lord. That is the, it's the way in which we see the manifest presence of the spirit, or I could even say it like this. Some people ask me, how do I look at Jesus? Because we always use these terms like just gaze upon the Lord. People say, how do I just gaze upon the Lord? Well, you give attention to the Holy Spirit. Lord, our Holy Ghost, I give my attention to your presence. Knowing that the dove is in his eyes, you're looking at the Lord. This is beautiful to me. So look what it says next. It says, besides streams of water bathed in milk. I'll go through this quickly. But notice that the eyes of the Lord have the refreshing streams in them and also the milk of the promised land. So all that you're looking for, whether it be the milk of satisfaction, indicative of the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey, or the streams of water that the psalmist leads the sheep by that refreshes the soul, or the wonderful, uh, what do you call it, river of his delights, drinking of the river of his delights. This is all inside of eyeball to eyeball, face to face experience of the person of Jesus Christ. Why am I dry? Well, have you looked in his eye? (laughs) Dryness comes from lack of eye contact with the Lord. You see, it's easy to look in Christ's direction. It's a whole nother thing to look in his eyes. Because to look in his eyes, you got to be vulnerable. 
And you got to be willing to let him see all of the junk that is still in your heart that you're asking him to get rid of. And you got to be open and honest. As a matter of fact, if you look at, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word there for confess, you can look it up yourself. It means eye, eye to eye. Look at him. Remember when Peter fell, what did Jesus do? He looked at him because he wants to make eye contact and restore him. This is what Jesus does. He he wants eyeball to eyeball with you because it's personal, because it's intimate, because it's direct. It is the tenderness of Jesus that restores you with his own eyes when we give attention to his wonderful face. As we're told in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 18 and 4, 6, that the glory of God is the face of Jesus Christ. It, the glory isn't independent of Jesus. It's actually Jesus's face. So we are transformed into the same image by gazing into his face. And we know right in the in the center of the face, if you will, is the eyes. And so we see next, it says, uh, they're reposed in their setting, which shows me that as I make contact, eye contact with Christ, I give him personal face-to-face time. I, I give him all my attention. His eyes that are reposed or the, the word repose means resting in their setting, that he will settle me. He settles my heart. When I get flustered or I get uh, frustrated or I get overwhelmed, if I will take time to look into the eyes of the Lord, he will settle my heart. And as you know, those of you that have spent some sweet time of fellowship with Jesus, you realize he does this to you every single time you give him all your attention. He settles your heart. He bathes you in milk. You drink from the streams by the Holy Ghost power and the Holy Ghost life flow. Uh, Next thing here is his cheeks are a bed of balsam, banks of sweet scented herbs. This is really special because in order to smell the cheek, you have to be close to the Lord. There is a sweet fragrance of God that is only experienced by those who will come near. Those who are distanced have a fragrance of the Lord that they cannot experience. There is some sweet sense of him that cannot be sensed at a distance. It's coming close to his face where you can see that his cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet scented scented herbs. Now, this next one is very special. I love this next one. Why do I love him? She says, his lips are lilies. You know, Job tells us that the lips of the Lord are from from which come his words. His words come out from his lips. So we see that the lips are indicative of speech, speaking. And so she's saying his lips, his speaking are lilies. And you say, what's the significance of his lips being lilies? Well, if you look up lilies, you'll see that they are one of the most diversely colored flowers in the world. So this shows us that his voice comes to us in so many different ways. We have many diseases and he has many colors with which to treat those diseases. He has many maladies. Uh, I mean, he has many remedies for all our maladies, if you will. So you see um, his lips are lilies. Medicinal, uh, well, lilies are medicinal. So he can actually heal you by speaking to you. Some of you have experienced this before. You had pain in your heart or one word just came. One thing he whispered to you and it healed you up. Oh, and it's like it never happened. You remember it, but it doesn't have any power. It's almost like uh, you're numb in that area now. He healed it all up. Maybe you need direction. Maybe you need a just a, a fresh reminder of his love. Maybe you just need a whisper in your ear. Maybe you need encouragement. Whatever you need, the, whatever the variety of needs you can find, there is a lily for that. And it comes from his lips. His lips are lilies. Why do I love him? Because he heals me with his sweet whispers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name above every name. So it goes on here. Look at his lips are dripping with liquid myrrh. You have to see this. In Exodus, the anointing oil is made with myrrh. <laughs> so we want the anointing, right? People are like, I want the anointing. They're seeking the anointing. Here's where it is. It's a product of his lips. His lips drip grace and that speaking of grace into us is the receiving of the anointing. So the anointing is not sought. It's caught 
from the lips of Jesus. You are the sum total of whatever Jesus has spoken into you. He shapes you by speaking to you. Whatever anointing you're going to have, specifically for whatever task God has for you, it's going to be connected to direct exchange with his voice. His lips <laughs> drip with liquid myrrh, that which makes the anointing. Next one, it says his hands are rods of gold. This is very interesting because the word for hands here has to do with strength, his power. So his power are rods of gold. This is interesting too because the word rods is actually the same word for hinges, like a door opens on hinges. Yes, they had hinges back in those days. So the hinges, everything hinges upon his power and his power is his hands. Are you seeing this? So what is the most powerful thing upon which hinges everything that has to do with Christ's hands? It is the nail pierced hands. This is indicative of the holes in his hands, the symbol of his crucifixion, the, the glorified scars that Jesus still has to this day. And this is how the apostles knew him. When he broke bread, they saw his hands as he broke the bread and they saw the nails, holes in his hands and they knew who he was. This is what opens the eyes to seeing who Jesus is, a revelation of his wonderful nail pierced hands. It is the gospel that opens the eyes. So we see his hands, his strength is the wonderful and, and upon which hinges everything is his wonderful hands. Now it goes on here to say that he, they're set with barrel, his hands, his power, his strength that is upon which hinges everything is set with barrel. It's interesting when you look up the word set, the word set has to do or actually is the word finished. His work, his power upon which hinges everything is finished. Jesus said this word in in uh, the New Testament, when his crucifixion was ending, he says, it is finished. This is indicative of the great exploit of his power, the greatest exploit of his power by which he rendered demons powerless. He stripped them and made an open spectacle of every principality and power. Every demon in hell was literally exposed naked and paraded through the street by the perfect work of a naked God dying on a tree. That is what we're seeing here. Why do I love him? Oh, because he is just these things. His hands are rods of gold and set with barrel. It's interesting too, to notice that barrel is a stone. One of the stones actually that the priests wore into the, the holy place to intercede. And we know Jesus is our great high priest, our great high priest. I just realized yesterday, actually, that when they were casting lots for Jesus's garment, remember this, it says that they, uh, they wanted his garment because it was a quote, seamless garment. And if you look at Exodus and Leviticus, the priests were required to wear garments that were seamless. Jesus wore an ephod garment. He wore a seamless garment on the earth. Literally, he was a walking priest. He is the one who took the barrel, literally that stone that had your name on it, and he puts it on his chest as the Melchizedek priest. And he walks in to heaven with your name upon his chest. And to this day, the Bible says he still intercedes for you. There's no reason to fear, no reason to be afraid. If you could hear the son of man crying out for you and praying for you, you would have no fear, nor would you worry. You would just hear that Christ himself with his perfect access to God is saying your name in prayer. He He's praying for you even to this day. This is the glory of why we love him. His hands, his work, his glorious, powerful work with his hands upon which hinges everything is finished as the great high priest. Next thing it says here is his abdomen is carved ivory. Now, this is interesting because Solomon wrote this book and Solomon was a king and Solomon 
had a throne from which issued his rule, and his throne was made of ivory. Solomon's throne was made of ivory. So his body is literally his body is where is it here? As carved ivory. His abdomen, his body is carved ivory. This shows us something that the body of the of the bridegroom, the body of Christ, is connected to the rule of the king. This is showing us that those that are ruled by the king are part of the body. This is the beauty of the son of man, that when you come underneath his rule, you are part of his body. Praise God. And then it goes on to say here, not only that it's carved in ivory, but inlaid with sapphires. It's interesting to note in Exodus, you will find that God's throne in heaven is said to be on top of sapphire. So you see, Christ's throne is made of ivory or Solomon's throne is made of ivory, symbolic of Christ's rule, that those that submit to his rule are part of his body and that rests upon the rule of God, which is that, that, that foundation of sapphire that God's own throne sits on. So it's almost as if it's showing us that Christ's rule rests upon God's rule. And those that submit to Christ's rule are part of his body, which rests upon the rule of God. <laughs> to me, it's just incredible. The next thing here is it says his legs are pillars of marble or alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. Interesting that his legs have gold underneath them and his head is gold. So from top to bottom, he is glory. He is glory in the top, glory in the bottom, everything in between, whether it be his eyes, his lips, his hands, his 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 abdomen, carved ivory, all of these things from start to finish are gold. In other words, the glory of God, all these things are sandwiched between the glory of God. They're all manifestations of his wonderful glory. His legs are pillars. This is really interesting because the word pillar touches is, is actually a column, which is touches the earth and goes up. I mean, you, you've seen a pillar before. It touches the, the ground and it goes up. This is indicative of Christ who is above coming down to touch the earth. As a matter of fact, the word priest comes from the word pillar because pillar and priest both touch the ground and go up into the heavens. The priests stand before God on the earth and this is there on behalf of men going up to God. Christ is the one who stands for men in the heavens. <laughs> he is the wonderful pillar. And the fact that it is made of marble just means that he is stable. I remember a story from Robert Murray McShane. He was meditating on this verse that his legs are pillars of alabaster, of marble. And he went to see this little sick young boy. He was dying. And uh, the boy was uncertain of if he was going to go to heaven or not. So McShane prayed for him to be healed and also preached the gospel to him. And his chosen text for preaching the gospel to the boy was, his legs are pillars. In other words, uh, he is stable. Christ is stable. And Mer Andrew, uh, uh, he leaves, uh, sorry, did I say Andrew Murray? I meant Robert Murray McShane. Robert Murray McShane leaves. Days later, he comes back to see the sick boy. Unfortunately, the boy is not healed, but he looks at McShane with faith in him. And McShane says, what happened? You're, you're sure now that you'll go to heaven? He says, yes, I am. He says, what changed? He says, I meditated upon what you said, that the beloved's legs are pillars of alabaster and marble. He says, and I realized that that means he is strong enough to carry me into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought that was beautiful. The stability that comes when you recognize he has the strength to carry you. Even as it says in Isaiah chapter 63, it says that he lifted them and carried them. He has all power and all strength to do this for us. The next thing it says here is his appearance is like Lebanon. And I want to just tell you a couple of things about Lebanon. Lebanon is north of Jerusalem and it has snow capped mountains, white mountains. So you have to see here that when he says like Lebanon, his appearance is like Lebanon, you're talking about unmovable mountains that are white. <laughs> so you see his immovable purity. You see his, 
his strength and purity, white as snow. Praise God. And this is what his appearance is like. And then she says, choice as the cedars of Lebanon. So in Lebanon, the cedars are the tallest trees, which shows us again that Jesus is higher than all the others. There may be all kinds of tall things, but one that is taller than all of them, higher than all the other trees, is he who is the cedars of Lebanon, Jesus the Christ, immovable and pure. And then this is the last little bit here in verse 16. It says, his mouth is full of sweetness. If you've ever experienced the sweetness of God, you know that it has this incredible ability to numb you to anything else. It has this incredible ability to lift you into the highest delight known to mankind. And you realize this, that it is his mouth that is full of sweetness. In other words, there's nothing in his mouth that isn't sweet. Everything he does, even his rebukes are so sweet. He is full of sweetness. And this next part, I love this next part. It says, and he is wholly desirable. I looked up the word for holy and it is actually every, all, any, all, entire. Like it is all of the ways you can describe any and everything. He is completely desirable. What this means to me is that he is like a giant magnet. Everything about him pulls everything about you to himself. When you see Christ rightly, you can't but be pulled towards him. That's why it is important as we preach the gospel to show him in his beauty and his love. Because when you when they see him rightly, he pulls them towards him, that he would die for them when they don't deserve it, that he would love them enough. This is the key to drawing people to Christ. The last thing we want to do is trap them in a corner and collect their consent. What we want to do is show them the beauty of Jesus and let them choose because that's what the that's where real pe people really being born again comes from. And it says, and this is my beloved, this is my friend. He is the one that I love and he is a friend to me. A friend, as the scripture says, that that sticks closer than a brother. All right, guys, that's, that's what I had for you. But let me pray and let me just encourage you bef before I go. Um, you are the apple of God's eye. You, you say me, you, you are the apple of God's eye. You say, Eric, you don't know me. I don't have to know you because he died for you already. <laughs> Eric, you don't know what I've done. You, you're forgetting. He died for you already. Yeah, but I've rejected him. You're not getting it. He died already for you. you, you but you say, yeah, but how many times have I turned away from him? He maxed out his showing of love to you already. So I encourage you to just yield to the kisses of his mouth. I encourage you to yield to the flood of love that he wants to fill you with. It will move your heart. He will break you with gentleness. And by his kindness, you will genuinely repent, not because you're afraid of going to hell, but because you realize that he is so wonderful and so beautiful that you'd be a fool to not choose one who would die for you. There's not even other people that would die for you. But Jesus, God of gods, King of kings would die for you. There's no one like this. And yes, he did save us from hell. And there is a real hell that men will burn in forever. But Jesus went there for those that were on their way there to stop them from going there. That's another demonstration of his, his incredible love. So I want to tell you, he loves you. If you could see how much joy you brought his heart and bring his heart, you wouldn't even believe it. The scripture says in Revelation 1, 6, to him who loves us, not just loved us. It's easy to think, oh, he loved us in the past. No, no, he loves you. He loves you. And it's not just the love that he's made a decision to do something good for you. He loves you, meaning he has affection for you. He desires you. He feels for you. He feels for you. 
His heart cries and weeps and bleeds as he cares for your needs. This is how he is longing for your attention and desiring you. I encourage you to give him what he deserves. That is the attention and affection of your heart that leads to true in complete, wholehearted obedience to him. Father, thank you for everyone watching. I ask you in your precious name that you would do something in them to quicken their hearts to life, Lord, and bring them to a new place of recognition of your beauty and your splendor and your majesty and the glory of your name and the wonder of your person. I pray they smell the fragrance of your nearness, Lord, that they would see the glimpses of your beauty, Lord, that they would taste and touch, Lord, that you'd make yourself audible and tangible to them in the spirit and that they would fall in love with you and go forth as heralds from the king's chamber to lead all men to the one who loves them. Amen. 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 Wow. Um, thank you very much, Eric. That was like, wow, wow. Um, I, that, there's no words um, to describe, but thank you very much for your um, obedience to, to God. Um, and yeah, like literally, as you can see in the chat, everybody's loved it. Um, it was, it's, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, do you, do you mind if we just take like three questions quickly? Yeah, sure. Is there, is, is it possible to get this recording from you or no? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'll send it over, um, to you, um, right after, like when I download it. Yeah. I'll definitely be able to get that to you. Great. Great. Yeah. I'll take a couple questions. We got a couple minutes. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, if anybody has questions, I'm going to take three, just three. Um, and yeah, um, shoot them across. Cool. The first, the first question, um, I'll ask is, um, how, um, how, what would you tell somebody that feels like they are constantly, um, adore, like adoring God, but they still feel a distance? What would you tell them, a person like that? And it's going to sound really basic. Yeah. And it's, and it's going to sound almost like I don't understand the question, but this is the only way I can answer it because it's the only thing I've seen in my own life to help me. It is to remember the gospel. Go back to the gospel and look at the demonstration of his love in the gospel until it breaks your heart. Uh, I would yeah. encourage everyone to do this as a daily practice because it makes your heart come to life. I'll, I'll end with this, this scripture. We love him because he yeah. first loved us. In other words, our love is an echo. Yeah. But if you, if you don't, if you don't look at or give attention to the first speech, it's hard yeah. for that echo to come out. So I would just right. encourage anyone who's having a hard time experiencing the sweetness of God's love yeah. Go back and look at the gospel over and over and over again until it breaks your heart and you believe it enough to realize that he has brought you in to the wow. presence of God and installed his spirit on the inside. Wow, no, that's amazing. No, um, thank you very much um for that. Um I, we've got one more question, um, sure. and then that's it. And then we will um yeah, so Callum, you can ask your question. Sure. Well, um, thank you so much for sharing that word. It was so powerful. Like I've never, I've never like heard about um, like that whole, you know, what you were sharing about the beloved and what Christ is like and his body. I just never heard that before. And it's just touched me differently, like <laughs> on another level. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask you, obviously you're somebody that I know has a very, very powerful intimacy with God. You're very like I see you some very very close to the, to the Lord and, and to Christ and to His heart. Um, how are there like what are some ways you've been able to cultivate that intimacy in your own personal life um, as something that we could take on and put into our own lives? How have you been able to cultivate intimacy with the Lord? Yeah. What a, what a great question, Colum. Um, I'm going to speak to you from my own heart. I got to tell you, first of all, that I'm only one person in this massive kingdom. I'm only one perspective in the midst of a multifaceted diamond of wisdom that's out there. So I just want to submit that to you first. So if you don't feel like what I'm saying, you know, settles with your heart, then just let it, just forgive me and let it roll off your back. So I, I'm only going to talk to you from my own personal experience, but I'm not going to say this is across the board, you know, 
Like this is infallible. You know, I'm just telling you, talking to you open heartedly. Okay. For me personally, my life has been radically changed and shaken by taking extended time to just worship and read the word and pray through the word of God. What I mean by that is looking at my calendar and finding a couple of days, a a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or a Saturday and Sunday, or even just all day Saturday, and locking away from humanity, not talking to any people, not looking at any devices, not listening to any music, just sitting in a room in absolute silence for a day or a few days with just a jug of water, maybe a few pieces of bread, a Bible, a notepad, and a pen. Just staying there, lingering in his presence, praying in the spirit, reading through the scriptures, praying the scriptures back out, worshiping the Lord, getting lost in worship alone with my heart, letting my heart just stay and linger upon him, conscious of my union with him, just enjoying the sweetness of his presence. I have found that that more than anything else has softened my heart to the Lord. Uh, So I guess I would encourage anyone who is saying, I want to know God in a deeper way. I will say to you, get away from people, go into a solitary room, shut the door and stay there for as long as you can and just worship him with no other agenda than to just worship him and see what it says about him in the scriptures to pray those things back to him. And I promise you, you will either break up or you will break through and you will find that he can touch your heart like no one else. And you'll find it is even greater because of the time that you spent than even the things that you've experienced in a moment. You'll find that even after you leave the place, if you've been there for three days or so and you haven't heard any sounds or seen any people, you'll find you feel as if you're an alien, like you're from another world. You go into a loud sounds, jar you, your heart is so still, it, you, you don't understand uh, busyness, you don't understand um, complexities and, and what's it called, uh, just the craze and multiplicities of life, they bother you because you've, bec- you've become so settled and you've learned in that time, even, even if it's a short period of time, he trains you like this and you become so settled and so quiet on the inside in such a restful, satisfied state that you feel as if you need nothing else. And you can be led by the spirit and you're very tender towards people, tender towards environments that you're in. And you can, uh, you can just sense that, that I, I love saying the word tender because it's the best way to say what I feel when I come out uh, from being with the Lord for an extended period of time. So the answer to my question is I would call them. I would go into a room for three days. Don't talk to anybody. Just tell the people that need to know, go in there for three days with a jug of water a couple pieces of bread, a Bible, a notepad, and a pen, and worship Jesus for three days straight. If you fall asleep, just get up and start again and just worship him, man, for an extended time in his presence. And I promise you, if you did this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Monday, you will be a man that will that will that that is so different than the man you were, and you will never be able to go go back being the man you were on on Thursday before you started Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I encourage you with this. 